We have quorum now, so I want to call the meeting to order and I declare the meeting open to the public. Can I remind members that the committee meeting has been broadcast uh, virtually through out our three parliament buildings and online. Um, it's it's been held fully virtually again today, and everyone is attending via video conference. So at the moment we have full attendance. We have myself, Emma Sheeran, the chair. We've got Mike Nesbitt, the vice chair, Paula Bradshaw, Michelle McElveen, Carol McKillen, Mark Durkin, and Christopher Stalford. And um, I know that Michelle has advised us that she's going to be leaving early, but I think apart from that, we should be all right for the rest of the meeting. Um, so if we can go to the first item on the clerics, apologies, and we don't have any apologies for today's meeting. And then our second item is a briefing by Tony O'Reilly, um, who's going to give us a, a briefing today on rights of persons with disabilities. Tony is a member of the Management Committee of the Northwest Forum of People with Disabilities, and he's been a human rights activist in the North for over 30 years. So if everyone's happy, I want to welcome Tony to the meeting. Hello, how are you? Tony, how are you? Okay, we can you see me okay? Or? We can see and hear you, so if you want to begin your briefing, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, I'd like to th thank the members of the committee for, for having us here today. Um, as, uh, as, as you've highlighted, um, I'm with the Northwest Forum of with Disabilities. It's an organisation of disabled people. Uh, we're a human rights organisation. We provide support and advice and mediation support for disabled people. Uh, and also children and young people uh, with, with uh, parental guidance and consent. Uh, we, we, have, we do qu quite a range of uh, activities from policy intervention to advocacy to mediation to everything under the sun. We're entirely voluntary. We do, we do our services are free of charge and the only requirement for support from our organisation is that you be a child or an adult with a disability uh, to receive our support and our expertise. Uh, the organization was founded in 1994 to promote the human and civil rights of disabled people, not just in the Northwest, but throughout the whole, the, the, throughout the whole of Northern Ireland. Um, I just, I, do I just begin my presentation or? Okay, um, we're here uh, also as part of the Northern Ireland Human Rights Consortium. We are supporting the uh, Making Our Future Fairer campaign. Uh, there are several hundred organisations, obviously, uh, you'd be aware, who are supporting uh, the Bill of Rights campaign. And um, one of the questions that you've asked in your survey, is the Bill of Rights important? Do we need a Bill of Rights? We would say a Bill of Rights is not important. Um, we would say a Bill of Rights is urgently required. It doesn't quite state um, the importance of a Bill of Rights, uh, um, particularly for people with disabilities. Um, and one of the key reasons for that is in the since uh, post the agreement uh, and before the agreement, but post the agreement, there was a guarantee given that there would be a uh, a Bill of Rights, and it wouldn't just be about the usual uh, two communities and nationalism and unionism and all of that. It would be about broader rights, as um, the former uh, Deputy First Minister mentioned in his evidence to the committee. It would be about group rights and equality and other rights and experiences of people uh, living in Northern Ireland and not just the, 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 the two communities, i.e. nationalism uh, or unionism. Um, and this was an opportunity for us as an organisation to uh, to get involved and say why disabled people have a, a critical critical role to play. And indeed, we were involved at the very, very beginning when this was first discussed back in the beginning of this century. Um, we were at the, at the forefront of, of the campaign for a Bill of Rights back then, uh, almost 25 years ago. Why is it important? Well, it's important for a very simple reason that... Um, Disabled people, disabled children, we don't really have rights. In fact, uh, in a Northern Ireland context, we're not even really considered as human beings because what we have and what we're classed as being are people with special needs. And therefore, um, our issues are put in the context of needs. We're seen as resource-based, resource-intensive, and we're not seen in a, in a human rights context and, and haven't, haven't been 
uh, uh, here and in quite a few other countries around the world because if you put something in the context of needs and you don't deal with it, then you can say, oh, well, that's not an urgency. It's an unmet need. It's an unmet need, so we're okay. We can, you know, we'll get there. We'll do the best we can, but they're not that important. And, of course, we couldn't be that important because if we're not even human beings entitled to fundamental human rights and understood within the context of human rights, how could we be important? Um, and then we had... In the middle of this, in the middle of this, um, 2006, we had the UN Convention on Human Rights. And of course, disabled people all over the world and disabled children, we all got excited because at long last, we were going to be seen as human beings entitled to fundamental human rights. So the issues that we faced on an ongoing basis would be seen within for, for the first time in a human rights context. So we, we got all a bit overexcited. And then, of course, the, where the UK ratified the UN Convention in 2009, and we had the periodic review of the, uh, the periodic examination of the UK, which includes Northern Ireland, uh, of their progress on the rights of disabled people. And of course, as you probably are aware, the UN Convention uh, on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities Committee concluded that there were systemic and grave violations of disabled people's human rights in the UK and that in terms of the rights of disabled people that the UK government was going backwards rather than forwards in terms of maintaining those rights. The language of rights, the language of human rights, the, the idea of human rights for disabled people remains the most critical because we can be understood as human beings entitled to the same rights as everyone else on the same, on, on the same level as other human beings then we're, we're in the game and then people will understand why it's so important for people with disabilities to be included. Just to give you an example, we spoke to the former First Minister way back, I think before the, just, just after the Assembly fell. In fact, the day after we were at, we were at, the, we were at the party conference and we, we met with the former First Minister and I said to him, oh, uh, we're the Northwest Forum of People with Disabilities. Uh, we're a human rights organization. And he replied, I thought you were a group of disabled people. So even he acknowledged that disabled people <laughs> were not human beings and weren't necessarily entitled to fundamental human rights. So um, first of all, so it's about recognizing that disabled people are human beings and are entitled to human rights and their issues must be understood within the context of human rights, not within the context of resources, not within the context of unmet need or a burden on society or people that are always whinging or demanding or moaning for something. We're demanding basic human rights, the same that everyone else has. Now, there's an argument that, um, you know, well, you know, you have the European Convention on Human Rights and you know, all of those things. That doesn't uh, supplant the idea or undermine the notion that a Bill of Rights in Northern Ireland, specific to, 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 to the people of Northern Ireland, I apologise, Raphael Nadal's getting a bit excited in the background there, it's my last app, so, he's in, so um, I apologise for the noise. Um, um, so, I'm um, sorry, because of the noise, I, I've been distracted now with what I'm saying. But basically, um, we, we, we would like to see our rights included within a Bill of Rights um, and our issues understood within that context. Now, people say, well, you know, it's very resource intensive, you know, uh, we're doing every, everything we can and, you know, and we've got equality legislation, out of date equality legislation, uh, 12, tw 12 years behind England, Scotland and Wales and their legislation in relation to uh, disability is also out of date. It doesn't meet with the requirements of Article 5, Equality and Non-Discrimination of the UN Convention on the Rights of, of Persons with Disabilities. And um, the UN Committee has made this clear. Uh, that was made clear in 2017. The Equality Commission for Northern Ireland, uh, which is also part of the independent mechanism for the monitoring of the Convention, also made it clear uh, as early as 2009 that our legislation uh, for equality and the human rights of disabled people was not fit for purpose. We're now in 2021 and we still, our legislation is still not fit for purpose. 
And so a Bill of Rights would address things like that. But also, it would also address things like, um, let's look at uh, Social Security and the burden uh, placed on disabled people through the Social Security reform. Uh, disabled people have been thrown into poverty. We, through our own direct experience, know of disabled people who have died. Who have died as a result of these welfare reforms. Sorry, I was just thinking of uh, Rory, one of the guys that uh, lost his life there uh, recently. But anyway, I wasn't expecting that. Apologies. Um, we have known people who have died because of these welfare reforms where disabled people are being asked to go through a, a degrading and unlawful process to try and get their basic entitlement to their human right to social security. Sorry. Sorry you're 100%. Do you want to take a wee second? Sorry. I was just thinking of Rory there. That was the guy who lost his life. Anyway. Um, my friend, anyway, had um, applied for um, had applied for the benefit, and um, I told him not to worry. There was a protection mechanism in place, and it would, he would likely be the subject of a of a paper based review. And because of his history, of mental health issues, he wouldn't he wouldn't have to go through um, this assessment where you're you're under interrogation for about an hour, maybe two hours or in some cases, a lot less, uh, where the person sometimes, quite a lot of the time, doesn't listen to you and are just anxious to tick the sheet. And I said, you'll be OK. But of course, that wasn't the case. He wasn't put, he wasn't uh, recommended for a paper-based review. And in fact, he got a letter uh, saying that he would be assessed for PIP. And um, this, triggered, um, uh, this triggered his mental health um, process and in the long term it ended and it ended with the loss of his his life so it's not just that disabled people are being targeted by cuts in public services and are being thrown into poverty or that they they're now having to beg for their right to social security or that they they they, they uh, well these are all things that have created what's known as a perfect storm where, where disabled people have become not just not just uh, facing inequality, but are going further and further and further outside the fringes of society in terms of their treatment. Uh, it's a it's a it's been acknowledged by the UN committee uh, that disabled people are been treated abysmally, and they should not be the subject and the target of cuts and uh, and uh, the abuses uh, by by the state party. Now. There are financial pressures um, on government. There are there are financial pressures on all of us. We are now in the middle of a COVID uh, pandemic, and very much been felt by disabled people in particular. Uh, you'll note the piece of research in England just last week that noticed that six out of ten disabled people are uh, have died uh, in terms of the statistics. Um, uh, as a result of, of COVID and are, are, are the most affected group um, of all of the different equality constituencies. You'll note that, um, that um, there is no emergency provision plan. There was no separate emergency provision plan like Australia and Canada where they, under Article 11 of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, you're required to do an emergency provision for the protection of the rights of persons with disabilities. The initial state report, um, the UK statewide report, didn't refer to an emergency plan. And indeed, the Northern Ireland Assembly's own report in two th state report back in 2011 made no reference to it and has no emergency plan for people with disabilities, um, despite the obvious impacts that an emergency situation, and in this case, a COVID pandemic, might have. So we're in a situation where we feel that disabled people's rights disabled children's rights have been ignored for far too long. Only this week and in the last 48 hours, a mother uh, had, was, 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 was uh, taking her child to hospital who had complex support requirements. And um, her, her child was left to wait for almost an hour um, in, in soaking clothes for a hoist 
despite the fact giving the parent giving the, the hospital advance notice. And the previous, in the previous March, going to the same hospital, the child was put into the bed, put into a bed that wasn't safe or secure for the child, didn't meet the, the child's particular requirements, and the child fell out of the bed. The hospital wrote an apology and said they were training their staff and they were going to get a hoist. There's no care plan for that child. There's no, there was no coordination. And, uh, said, and, and then they said, and we'll also look to our, char our, parent, our parental charity, our pa pa parents' charity, to see about getting to see about getting a bed for your child. Now there are other children, other adults with disabilities in this situation. The right to have a bed in hospital, the right to be secure in hospital, the right to be treated with dignity is fundamental. And this is why a, a, a Bill of Rights is required. Now, one of the things I just want to finish off with is you're probably aware that uh, Scotland, the Scottish Government, on October the 23rd, and again on October the 26th of, of last year, announced that they were removing PIP. They announced they were removing PIP because they didn't want disabled people to have to jump through continuous hoops, um, to continuous hoops to get their, to get basic, to get their basic income and adequate standard of living and social protection. They said from their 70 disabled persons panels that it was degrading and it, it, it mounted to being un unlawful. Now, we've argued this before with MLAs, and MLAs have said to us, oh, but, you know, we have to think of the block grant. We have to think of parity. They're not, they're, there's no guarantee that the Scottish government system will lead to equality of outcomes. But what they do point out is they follow seven basic human rights principles, and they focus essentially on the principle of dignity, how we treat people. When they, when they need our support and they need our help as a society and a community. And um, there, there's, so the methodology could change without breaking parity. And in fact, it's also been drawn to our attention and research that we looked at. We were also part of a disability expert panel, uh, in fact, appointed by one of the members of this group when they were minister. Uh, it's also been pointed out by the, the, by the, in, the, in the research that money could be saved Huge amounts of money could be saved by removing the private sector involvement in the delivery of PIP work capability assessments if they were made in-house and given the respons clear responsibility of ministers. And that a fortune could be saved in, in that regard. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to stop there. Um, I wasn't expecting, I apologise for an emotion. I didn't, wasn't expecting that at all. <laughs> sorry, I apologise. No, no, Tony. Look, thank you very much um, for, for your account. And... Um, don't, there's no need to apologise at all. Um, I mean, it was, I was, you were speaking your own truth, and and uh, that was was very helpful for us, and and and, and moving and powerful, and so appreciate that. And, and we definitely don't have any need to, to apologise. Um, you, you've given us a very clear account of of your own uh, particular thoughts around the Bill of Rights and, and how necessary it is. I suppose one of the, the, and you've referred to it as well, one of the, the conversations that we've been having with a lot of the experts that have given us advice here is sort of rights versus resource. Um, and, you know, people have made the argument that we can't deliver particular rights because there's a finite amount of, of money. And my own view would be that that's not good enough and that we should use a Bill of Rights as an accountability measure to make sure that ministers and governments are doing what they have to um, for the entire community and, and for people that have um, different life circumstances and don't have a quality of opportunity um, on, the, on that basis. And I think that a Bill of Rights would, would serve to, to remind governments and, and ministers of their responsibilities. Um, I, I wondered if, if you would if you would touch more on, on that, if you could. Well, um, you know, um, we're well aware of that argument, but if I could just go back to the, the Social Security argument and, uh, and the Scottish Government, they're, 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 they're keeping with parity, but they're changing the methodology, for example, of how they're doing things. And they're saying that fundamentally the dignity of a human person is the most important, and we have to treat people with dignity. Now, we may not have... The resources today or or tomorrow for everything that's happening or the mental health crisis 
uh, that's happening in our society, or the, the special educational needs sector, or whatever you want to call it. But when you put human rights in place, what you're telling government and what you're telling society, because it's not just the responsibility of government. When you put a Bill of Rights in place, it's a, it, as the Human Rights Commission have already identified, it's a social contract. It's a contract between the people of society and the, gov and the government of that society that they would hold, uphold basic human rights. So one of those human rights, if you, like, if you look at the general principles enshrined within, say, for example, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, is the right to dignity and the right to treat people with dignity and compassion. That is a fundamental right. And our current social security provision doesn't provide that. You may not necessarily have to spend any more money to follow the Scottish model. In fact, you could spend less. The argument that you need primary legislation and the, the issue of the block grant, we've seen, obviously, we've seen the Northern Ireland Audit Office report. We've seen the, the financial accountability. We're not expecting things to be changed in one day. Well, we have to begin to acknowledge that everyone is entitled to human rights. And everyone, everyone, all, as stated in the agreement, equality and respect for all, benefits from human rights. There's nobody that wouldn't benefit from, from human rights. Most countries in the world have a Bill of Human Rights, whether it's the Bill of Rights in America or countries in Europe. Most countries in the world have a Bill of Rights, a human rights. That's a fundamental principle of which society should be judged. It's not based on resources have to be available now. Human rights is a gradual process. It's an evolutionary process, and it's about building towards it. It's not about, right, I haven't got the money, so let's skip the Bill of Rights. We've been bidding on this now for nearly a quarter of a century since this debate first began at the beginning of this century. And this was something that was agreed in the Good, in the Good Friday Belfast Agreement, and we still don't have it. Why? Thank you. Tony, I, th I think, you know, we're on the same page in this and, and your testimony there, I mean, coming from, from your, the, the, the life that you've lived and, and the, the people that you've known, you're, you're making that very clear in terms of, you know, a personal experience and, and what this means. And it, I think that's key, what you're saying there in terms of a social contract and that this, you know, whilst anybody can recognise that at a particular time, something might not be doable, that sort of commitment that, they want to do it and you know I would I would go further and I would argue that a lot of the, the things that we're talking about in terms of rights aren't delivered for you know political reasons and that you know we can always find the money that we need to find for particular things and I don't to be honest I don't accept that argument that you know there's only a finite amount of resources and therefore we can't deliver x y or z because you know we prioritize things so if we prioritize rights and live in a rights-based society um, I, I think it would follow on that the people would be, you know, treated as human beings. And, and some of the examples that you've given there, I know that we all probably as MLAs in our constituencies can think of people that are going through, you know, some of the examples in terms of people appearing at a hospital and the particular um, sort of uh, support mechanisms or the, you know, the bed or the, the furniture that they need not being available, like, I know I definitely have had constituents in circumstances like that, same with care in the community and care packages and people not being, being treated with dignity. So, look, I don't want to to, to go over old ground. I just thank you very much for, for your for your uh, input there. It's, it's, it's really useful and, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I'll go on now to the Vice Chair, Mike, and I can see Christopher has a hand up as well. Anybody else wants in there? Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, and Tony. Thank you very much for uh, for engaging with us today. And um, you're welcome. Just, I'm sorry for your loss. I'm also sorry to hear. Sorry, you I, I don't want to say it's, it's not my loss. He's just he's a he's a, he's a he was a close friend. He was a very close friend. It's, it's, it's not it's not about my loss or it's just it's I'm just giving his, his life as an example where people have lost their lives as a result of these welfare reforms. And it's not just about the absolute poverty and abject poverty that people are facing as a result of the reforms. It's about how we approach that. Well, I wanted to ask you about that because pre-COVID, one of the most frustrating aspects of my work was accompanying people to PIPs appeals. And the experience I had was that the assessors were not taking due regard for people's mental health and capacity. 
So if you take like that question, can you prepare and cook a meal? A lot of people physically can. You know, they can open the tin and, and put something on a, on a gas burner. But they don't have the mental capacity to stay with it. And they might wander off. And next thing they're wondering why the fire brigade are at the front door. Mm. The assessors aren't. And is that your experience, that there is a terrible imbalance? There, there is a terrible imbalance. Some of our, some of our members have had, had a good experience. I myself uh, I have had a good experience of, of the assessment process. I don't want to say that, you know, that every assessment that every disabled person has had, but quite a lot of disabled people are, have had exactly the experience you've outlined, where they don't understand the nature of the disability and they don't understand the particular circumstances. They, we, all, we have to tell our uh, members or clients or people that we support, you know, when they're going in for this, the assessment, uh, you know, when they're being interrogated about this or been asked whether they can wipe their backside or and how do they wipe their backside and to demonstrate. Um, um, sorry, I won't embarrass anybody, but this is what disabled people have to have to go through. Um, um, they they that. Uh, well, I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to mention that I lie beside in the bathroom and that the pee is all over the floor, because uh, you know I want to keep a bit of my dignity here. And we have to tell them that the PIP assessment is not about your dignity. This is about getting you an income to deal with the extra costs related with, with your disability. And we need you to tell the truth and the absolute truth. This is not a dignified process. In fact, it's the total opposite. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, and, and I am guilty, I suppose, if you like, of, of, of giving that message to people I accompany. You, you, you've got to really lay it on, tell the truth. Tony, and, and you, you talk about, you know, we can't be doing this based on resource. It has to be based on rights. So it does make me wonder, how are you on this concept of progressive realisation? The progressive realisation of uh, um, is... Is, is something that's common with international human rights law. It's about it's about what steps we take and how we how how we look at the, the the rights that all different constituencies require and how we progress those rights over time. Um, and when you place something in the context of a right and the progressive realization of a right, what you're saying is yes, you do have rights. Yes, you are a person entitled to rights, but. At the, at, the, at the moment, you know, we're going to do this and we might do this. It doesn't quite go far enough, but we're getting there. And it's about being progressive and, and taking that approach. Uh, you've got to remember all these countries that have bills of rights all over the world uh, and countries that have come through conflicts like ours and our, our post-conflict societies, you know, like South Africa and so on and so forth. They, they haven't got it right. They, they have challenges facing the resources, but they have a bill of rights which is inclusive of the wider society and the wider community. And, uh, and that's something that we shouldn't be afraid of. You, you, you said in 2006 you got excited over the, the UN Convention, only to be disappointed. Could that happen with a bit of rights here? Uh, no. Uh, no, uh, for, 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 uh, no, on the basis that, at the very least, if disabled people were included and recognised within the Bill of Rights within Northern Ireland, at least they would be seen as human beings with human rights, as opposed to being dismissed as an unmet need or special need. Um, I, if, you're asking, if you're asking me, would the special education school sector have been included in COVID planning, had there been a Bill of Rights here, uh, and the key workers, and 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 not been excluded, I would imagine they would have been included. I would imagine that, that they possibly would have been included because we would have changed our mentality and approach from a human rights, a human rights based approach, and we'd have looked at those children in, in this uh, in the special education sector or in the health sector or adults or whatever within the context of human rights. I would imagine there would be some, there would be some progress. Maybe not the progress that we're hoping for. But there will be some progress in relation to the UNCRPD. Our 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 disappointment is that of all the states examined by the UN Convention on Human Rights, 88 criticisms were levelled at the United Kingdom, uh, uh, at the United Kingdom, and it was the worst criticised state 
of all the countries that have uh, uh, are signatories to the UNCR, UNCRPD, and there was significant number of uh, criticisms of of the Northern Ireland Assembly and it, it, and the failure of the Northern Ireland government here to adopt its rights. So those were disappointments. But I think if you have a Bill of Rights here, you're developing a human rights culture uh, and a culture of respect and dignity. And uh, I think the ball game would change significantly because it's our Bill of Rights. It's specific to the, all of the people in Northern Ireland. It's specific to the rights of unionists, nationalists, the LGBTQ community, older people. Disabled people. If you look at the if you look at the the wider equality constituencies, and you look at women's rights, and you look at you look at ethnic minority rights, you look at LGBTQ rights, and you look at the, all the list of rights, you will see the only two constituencies in in in, 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 in our li living here at the moment, older people and disabled people, they're always seen in terms of need. They're never seen in terms of having rights. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, the fi final point, Tony. So a Bill of Rights potentially is not just important in its own right as a document, yep. but in, to the extent in which it might change the culture with which we approach bringing forward legislation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, listen, I, I, I really appreciate your, your engagement. And, you know, we, we haven't discussed yet where we're going with this, but if, if we do get it over the line, for what it's worth, I, I will certainly be arguing that, that dignity uh, is front and centre of the Bill of Rights. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Mike. I've got Mark indicating, then Paula, then Carl. Hello, Tony. Great to see you. Ah, <laughs> it's been a while. Uh, thank you, Tony, for that powerful personal and pragmatic, which was most unlikely, <laughs> uh, uh, contribution that you've made today. Just picking up, and I had a couple of questions prepared after reading your submission, but the, as with every conversation with you, <laughs> Tony, it's going to go off on a wee bit of a tangent. Uh, the, the weaknesses, uh, I suppose, I suppose you're being kind, calling them weaknesses that you've pointed the, in the benefit system are something that we've been flagging up for some time, and I've been firmly of the view and remain of that view that parity doesn't mean or shouldn't mean parity and we should be trying to do things as best we can here. You've alluded yourself to the competing pressures you know, on public finance, but even when there's not enough money to go around, there should always be enough dignity to go around. And that has been sadly lacking in, in many areas. And, and, and PIP assessments is certainly one that a couple of members here have referred to in that. I've lost you. I... Oh. It's not just you, Tony. I think maybe. Sorry, left me back. So, it's uh, yeah, Tony, uh, I read a few of the witnesses we've heard from take a narrow view of particular circumstances in the agreement to mean identity and cultural rights. And now I know I and others actually uh, throughout our deliberations have highlighted how central socioeconomic issues were to the conflict here. It's also true, well, you can tell me if it's true, it's certainly accepted that the conflict has contributed to our higher than average proportion of people with disabilities. Yeah, Those particular rights of people with disabilities should be included in a Bill of Rights. Would that be your view? That would be my view, but you also raise another another issue because of because of uh, because of the conflict here, um, um, and because of the ongoing debate, and we're living in a post-conflict society, and nationalism, unionism, it takes up most of the oxygen and takes up most of the mainstream mainstream press and media, and with with the greatest respect, it occupies the minds of. Uh, our our politicians most of the time because it's it's the big issue. That means that the equality and human rights issues facing other constituencies, including disabled people, have 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 suffered as a result and have been lost and have been completely yeah. absent in the debate. Um, and I was we were explaining this. We met with the UN committee 
uh, giving back, we were explaining this to several members of the UN committee, and they said, well, yeah, but disability would be a high priority. And I said, no, not at all. In Northern Ireland, dis disabled people would be the least probably priority. We're, we're second class citizens. And indeed, the equality and human rights agenda generally would be quite low because we're still preoccupied with conflict. We're still preoccupied with post-conflict and the hurting stalemate that, that results from that. So we're not a very, we're not a very mature, a mature democracy in terms of uh, human rights and equality. But when we get a Bill of Rights and, you know, with the, and, and obviously with, the, with your report and what things we could do better, that'll help us bring us forward. And that's true of all post-conflict societies. But we've had now 20, 20 years of uh, the peace dividend, and it's now about time that the wider community and wider society and uh, the particular particular human rights and experiences, as you're, um, as already referenced by the former Deputy First Minister, uh, your your uncle, uh, Mark, uh, in, in the evidence, that they are addressed. And it isn't just about nationalism and unionism. It's about the human rights of everyone living in Northern Ireland uh, uh, and not just the two communities. Yeah, we, we have to do, do all we can to push those rights up the table because when they hover around the bottom of the table in terms of priorities, where they have been, the, the, the danger is that they just get relegated. You, you know, uh, and Tony, are there any particular rights or articulations of particular rights that were in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights that were particularly important for people with disabilities that we might seek to replicate here? Well, um, a particular right, uh, most important, is obviously, obviously, the right to life would be a particularly good one, and that also means uh, the the quality quality of life. And obviously, given given the cuts to services, social security, and everything else, an adequate standard of living and social protection, a fundamental human right, um, um, we we would like to see those particular rights given particular focus. And again, I would draw again to the Scottish experience where they have started to change their system, uh, and it doesn't necessarily cost a pile of money. It just means that they're now looking to see how they can treat people with a little bit of dignity and change the process uh, that to one that's less abusive and and could possibly result in in, uh, in less poverty and less loss of human life. Brilliant, Tony. Thank you for that. I'll, I'll, I'll let you go once you speak soon. No problem. Thank you, Mark. Okay, Mark. We've got Paula next. Paula, do you want to come in? Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, thank you very much for your presentation so far. A couple of the issues I was going to raise have already uh, been covered. Um, I just wanted to pick up on that point, and I, I hope I don't um, uh, make, make you upset again, but the, the issue there about... No, I apologise for that. No, 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 not at all. Uh, but the issue about suicide rates amongst young people, and when I met, went up to MenCap not that long ago, they were saying that, you know, in many ways, they're happy, the health service are happy to deal with their condition, um, but they forget that maybe there are mental health, poor mental health mm -hmm. issues there, and they, they don't get addressed. Um, and I suppose it might be difficult for you to answer this, but to what degree do you think that a lot of the poor mental health um, is attributed to that dignity and the societal support that they may feel just generally, and then systemic, which you'd sort of reference there more around, um, possibly access to benefits or infrastructure or other ways that there's just barriers in society that possibly we as an assembly could take down or legislate, you know, like the changing places, you know, the, the, the campaign yeah. then for better. So I'm just wondering, it's, is it emotional or is it um, systemic or, or what where, where, where would we be focused, should be focused on? The focus... Um... Mental health is very much uh, mental health is very much related on your emotional state of well being, and if you're being attacked from from all areas, from cuts to basic public services to cuts to your entitlement to social security or whatever, uh, or the methodology that you have to engage in and and go begging for it and go through an interrogation process, whether it's via the work capability assessment or via the PEP assessment or you're 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 sitting back and you're hoping that the twenty pound increase in in universal credit 
will remain because there are many disabled people now who no longer have the economic protections that they once had because as as a as a member of my board said, oh, they went to the assessment centre and they got cured. They they lost that disability overnight because they've lost all their benefit entitlements. Now appeal, they got it back, but they have to go through that process of appeal to get it back and they have to have the nerve to do it. Many disabled people don't. Many parents of disabled children don't. They think, oh, well, the initial decision's right. And then they go through this long burdensome process to get it back. So if you give people an adequate standard of income, but also, um, you know, you're on, you're, first of all, you're on your way. But secondly, and more importantly, and this is true of what the young people said on the, uh, on the, on the program Spotlight the other night, and you're talking about mental health, uh, and they made it clear. And this is equally true of young people and children with disabilities. We have a voice. Let us talk about our own experiences. We are experts on our own experiences. We walk in our shoes. Listen to us, talk to us, support us. Don't dismiss us or have someone else talk on our behalf. Um, and that's very true of children and young people with disabilities generally. But it's doubly, doubly, doubly true when it comes to children with disabilities. Uh, and it's also true when it comes to disabled adults. Um, so it, it, it's about making sure that people are listened to and are heard. You know, we, the Northwest Forum, had to go to the UN and argue with the UN to seek clarity on Article 4.3 on the voice of disabled people and children and young people and how important that was in decision-making processes that impacted on their lives, in particular in relation to young people and people's general mental health uh, and its relationship to how the independent mechanism worked and the role of disabled people in monitoring the implementation and monitoring the convention because um, since the UN convention came in, they had misunderstood the article, even the independent mechanism had, hadn't really understood fully the two articles, Article 4.3 and Article 33.3. We went to the, the UN committee uh, on behalf of the disabled persons led organization sector and said to them, look, we need your help here. We need decision makers, government, we need the independent mechanism. We need all these to understand what these two articles mean because they're, they're, they're not interpreting it correctly. We understand what it means. And thankfully the UN committee agreed with our assessment and agreed to, 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 to put out a general comment, which is a quasi-legal declaration as to what those, how those articles should be. That relates to, in part to mental health, because if you don't listen to a person and you exclude them and they have nowhere to go and you're not been listened to by decision makers and they're not getting this opportunity that I'm getting now to speak on behalf of disabled people in my organisation, you know, that's not going to that's not gonna help your, 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 your mental health is going to make it worse. And one of the things we learned the other night from the Spotlight Report is young people, people with mental health issues, they need to talk and they need that support. And that's not just in relation to, to big decisions or talking to MLAs or talking to chief executives or talking to, to committees, uh, uh, steam committees like this one. That's in relation just to, just to talking about, about your own particular circumstances, about what you want, what you feel is right for you, or what you feel is right for your constituency, either in a in a in a personal level or in a much wider societal level. Um, so it's about listening to people and making sure that that people know that you want to listen, and and that uh, it's important that, that that experience that they're having is important. Uh, thank you very much. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we can go to Carl now. Thank you um, for your presentation. Um, very, very powerful. So even just going from what you said is that uh, there does need to be a big inclusion of economic and social rights. Um, so that's a given. And the other aspect of it is, you know, even though there may be disability discrimination, um, it just doesn't go far enough. So there's a definite need to have that inclusion in a Bill of Rights. So I suppose for me, um, a bit like Mark, um, I mean, one of the things I, I know even from being in DSE, 
and even Deirdre's approach that the process of people are being assessed for disability needs to be brought in house and it needs to be human rights compliant. Um, but in absence of a Bill of Rights, um, how do you feel? Because that's going to be down to discretion and the personal instincts of a minister. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I suppose what I don't want to put words in your mouth, but basically what you're saying is that this Bill of Rights definitely has to have um, human rights and equality at its fore for everybody. Yes. Okay. And then the last thing I would say is that um, even, you know, even this morning, Paul and I were on the health committee. And one of the things that concerns me is that there's no full equality impact assessment being done on even the draft budget for health, for example. And it's a screening out exercise. So if there was a Bill of Rights there and a stronger adherence to human rights and equality, yeah. then we can't be screened out. We have to be included in. Yeah, well, even with, <laughs> you know, um, and this is in the, the, you'll know this from your previous position taken temporarily over as minister, you, you'd ask the, the different expert panels to, mm-hmm. to consider a range of issues. Uh, mm-hmm. And we did. You, you probably know I was one of we were on the the forum was on the mm-hmm. one of the members of the expert panel. Even with any quality impact assessment or screening in or screening out, that doesn't necessarily solve the situation. We've just looked at the Department for Communities Equality Impact Assessment that says one and a half million pounds has been wiped out from the advice sector. Mm-hmm. Um, what well, that means to us that disabled people won't be able to apply for universal credit PIP. Um, uh, or, you know, help and support with work capability assessment because that's where you go to get the free advice. They'll be still hostage to people who uh, will charge them 40, 30, 50 pounds to, to help them fill in their forms or do whatever. And a lot of the time, these cowboys, as I call them, uh, don't know what they're doing. And then they come to us and they say, I didn't get that's because you, you didn't do this, you didn't do that, you didn't do this, you didn't do that, and you need to do this and you need to say that. And uh, But he didn't say, say us to do it or she didn't say us to do it. And I said, well, that's because they're interested in your money, not your not your, not your, your entitlement to. So when you take money away and you take the advice sector away to support, whether it's disabled people, whether it's uh, ethnic minorities, whether it's older people, you're, you're taking people's access to, to income away. The the thing that you also said was you raised the issue of in house. The Scottish the Scottish model the Scottish model prioritizes the importance of in house assessments mm-hmm. and says that uh, any assessments in relation to disability benefits should be done only as a form of consultation and only if it's necessary, mm-hmm. and that evidence should be got the other way and that nobody should be put through any undue, undue stress or dignity. The other principle that I suppose the Scottish model uses, and I think you're you're sort of catching on to this, is ministers taking direct responsibility mm-hmm. for how citizens are being treated and hence how disabled people are being treated, rather than being farmed off and that that's responsibility somewhere else. Yeah. Um, and they they're quite proud of the fact that if a, a decision is made, the minister takes responsibility for that and stands by that decision, uh, and. And, and that high level responsibility. But also um, there was a particular uh, principle of economic costs, savings. And like, like Northern Ireland, Scotland have to make savings too on social security, on everything. And when they're competing with resources, they have COVID, they have people in the poverty circumstances as described in the spotlight a few days ago. They have, you know, similar things that we have. And what they what they've said is, look, you know, uh, if you remove these, if you have in-house assessments, you automatically start saving money. So it's not just about guaranteeing or trying to progress someone's human right to an adequate standard of living and social protection, but it's delivering what what government needs from a fiscal point of view. It's saving money. Yeah, the issue is that um, like I completely agree. Um, but the reason I pointed out the quality impact assessment was because up until now, Deirdre is the only one who's done it. And what just pointing out is, if the money isn't found, then this is the these are the services that are going to go. She's not saying she's cutting them, but just to have that in the record. Um, 
So it's just a big care. Um, when you're saying that it, the, the Department for Communities is the only department to do an equality impact assessment yes. on, on, on reforms, on yes. COVID measures yes. and all the rest, and none of the other departments are? No, they haven't done it yet. And okay. they should, because yeah. the, the issue is that what the point, the reason I'm bringing this up is that when you talk about human rights complaint and compliance, and the need to have inclusion, then you need to go as far as you possibly can to show, unless you get the proper budget for it, these are the things that are going to be cut, right? Yeah. Are these the things that, so, um, and the issue is that when it comes to advice, it comes to welfare, it comes to social protection, it comes to disability, it comes to isolation, benefits and all the rest, they shouldn't be negotiable. That's basically the message in that. Yeah. And that's the reason that they right across the board. However, the reason I'm raising that is that there, there is a, a school of thought that you shouldn't include social and economic rights in a Bill of Rights. There is a thought, and even from some of the witnesses we've had up until now, have said things like, oh, don't wind it out and don't include everybody because that's that's not the way to go. So who do you disc who do you who do you who well, do you who do you exclude? So which rights do you cherry pick and who's well, it's important. if we want to continue a history of exclusion, of excluding disabled people, of excluding black people, of excluding the LGBTQ community, of excluding older people and giving them substandard, um, substandard treatment, by all means, exclude. But if you want to think only of nationalism, whether it's under the guise of the tricolour or the Union Jack and the two large communities, a lot of people, you know, I respect people's rights. To, to, to the to the to the union. I respect people's right to their to nationalism, but there's a lot of people in Northern Ireland who are not interested in nationalism or unionism. They just want they just want a bed. They just want mm -hmm. dignity uh, uh, for two weeks while they're dying. They just mm -hmm. want to 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 you know the possibility of an extra week not having to go to a food bank. Mm -hmm. You know they they don't have time to think about these wider wider things that have preoccupied us for the last for the last. God knows how long. And and I and I completely agree. I completely agree. I believe you can't have a full bill of rights. And I'll finish in this chair. You can't have a full bill of rights without economic and social rights within it. And because if you, if you don't build it in, you're just constantly putting people who've been discriminated to the back of the queue or to the back of the bus. Well, the, the, sorry, just to, just to finish off, if you don't include economic and social rights, you're you're then in, you're then in, you're then contrary to the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. Well, Tony, this case has been in contrary to that for twenty three years. So, yeah, I agree well, yeah. with you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I think um, that's all the members. I don't see any other indications. So I think at this point, Tony, um, all that's left is to thank you again for your, your contribution this afternoon and the time that you spent with us. And I know we've questioned you greatly. I can hear the, the wee dog in the background there. So um, thank you very much I, again. That was that was really uh, powerful and, and, and useful. And I, I just appreciate your, your, your testimony and we'll let you get on with the, the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank much you. Appreciate. Brilliant. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Okay. We can now, members, um, just take a wee second and we can move on to the next um, item on our agenda. So um, item number three this afternoon is a briefing from Alexa Moore from Transgender NA. Members right, might remember that Alexa had written to the committee asking um, to present. She's a She's a director in Transgender NA and a trans right activist that has been um, involved in human rights now for some time. Um, she was a member of the Youth Forum um, in the North between 2016 and 2018 and has quite an extensive uh, background in this. And you'll find uh, the, the sort of briefing paper is the consultation response um, that Transgender had provided uh, to, the, to the consultation that had closed on the 5th of February. So Alexa, I'd like to welcome you to the meeting. Hi, thanks so much for having me. <clears throat> oh, Brilliant. Thank you very much, Doc. I'll, I'll not uh, go on any longer. Let you begin your briefing. Thank you. Of course. 
Um, so just first off, thank you all so much for for um, inviting me in today, and and um, we really do appreciate the opportunity to provide evidence to the committee on this. It's an incredibly important issue for for me and for transgender and I. Um, so by means of an introduction, uh, my name is Alexa Moore. Uh, I use she her pronouns, and I'm one of the directors of Transgender and I, which is a human rights organisation uh, which exists to support and advocate for trans communities in Northern Ireland. Um, so we do that in a lot of different ways, things like this kind of, you know, um, public consultations, uh, responses, um, kind of uh, public campaigning and advocacy, as well as individual supports. And we also run um, a community space for trans people in South Belfast. Um, so we, we, you know, cover all of Northern Ireland, but a lot of our work is Belfast based. I'm going to address a number of issues here today with the committee. Starting with our reasoning for supporting a Bill of Rights in Northern Ireland seems like a seems like a good place to start. Um, we have since our founding been strongly supportive of the Bill of Rights as a means of addressing some of the gaps in our quite frankly patchwork equality and human rights legislative framework. It's worth noting that we don't view this as a cure-all, as you know, something that has been discussed um, with, with Tony. Um, there are many more changes needed to the governance of this region and, and many other issues to address beyond the Bill of Rights. However, we view such a bill as a starting point for Northern Ireland taking a truly rights-based approach moving forward. And a bill would kind of provide the executive um, uh, with the framework to kind of pass policy and, and make legislation um, in a human rights compliant manner. Something that I feel has been lost in all of the politicking around this process is the context of the Bill of Rights. As Tony said, it was guaranteed in the Good Friday or Belfast Agreement to protect and uphold the rights of all communities in Northern Ireland. These protections are 23 years overdue. Um, and in those 23 years, human rights have gone unfulfilled for so many, as you know, you've already heard. Looking specifically at trans communities, the only adult gender identity service in Northern Ireland has been at a point of crisis for about three years now, and the effect on our communities has been monumental. Mental health has plummeted for so many in our communities, many of whom have now been waiting four or more years for basic access to healthcare. The treatment of trans people within those gender services has also been incredibly poor, uh, with many of our service users reporting that the invasive processes of these services actually worsened their mental health and in some cases traumatized them. There are some human rights abuses that are specific to, you know, overlapping sections of the community, for instance, um, non-consensual surgeries that are still today carried out to quote unquote normalize the appearance of intersex babies' genitals. The right to non-discrimination and the right uh, to access of health care uh, are very clearly not being met uh, for some communities in Northern Ireland. In the area of education, where trans young people have very little legal protection, the Education Authority published research into the LGBT community's experience in post-primary institutions, showing a complete lack of support for trans communities in school. Only 7% of trans respondents said that they faced no challenges due to their trans identity at school, and over 60% uh, said that their teachers handled trans issues badly in classes, with some reporting transphobic bullying, not just from pupils, but also from teachers and other school staff. We see such high rates of truancy and underachievement among trans communities in school, and is it any wonder our rights to accessing education are not being met? I could go on and tell you in depth about the fact that trans people also haven't been able to access legal gender recognition in about three years. I could talk about the human rights violations perpetrated by the PSNI in their treatment of the Black Lives Matter protesters and racialized people in general. I could tell you about the continued exporting of pregnant people in the event where they need basic reproductive rights. But I feel like I may be belaboring the point. Human rights have not been a concern in the government governance of this region over the past 23 years, and it's time for that to change. The second area I would like to address is one that I know has been an area of contention for this committee um, and something that has was briefly discussed um, with, with Tony previously, and that is the inclusion of so-called social, economic and cultural rights. Firstly, the fact that this is a contentious issue is quite frankly baffling to me. Um, it is imperative 
that the rights covered under this label, in particular those contained within the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, are enshrined in domestic law, especially in the wake of Brexit and the UK government's agenda of cutting workers' rights, slashing big holes in the safety net that is our welfare state, as again you've already heard, and regressing rather than making progress on human rights. I also want to, um, on a kind of more philosophical level, I want to object to the notion that we can discuss civil and political rights on one hand and social, economic and cultural rights on the other and not talk about how those rights are intertwined and are interlinked and are often inseparable. The right to freedom from cruel and degrading treatment is intricately tied to the ability of someone to have a home, to the support delivered by a social security net, to the ability to access timely and fit for purpose healthcare. Though the, that, that, uh, the right to freedom from um, torture and cruel and inhumane treatment is um, a kind of a civil and political right, and then the rest of those are economic, but they're, they're so interlinked you cannot separate them. Um, in Northern Ireland, where we most starkly see the rights to freedom from discrimination, again, civil and political right, being violated, is in the impoverishment of minority communities, high homelessness rates, underemployment, very little access to healthcare, discrimination against disabled people within our welfare state. We can't have civil and political rights without the economic rights. Anything else is nothing more than lip service. On that note, there was a suggestion in the public consultation that the entire bill could potentially be lip service, uh, which was quite worrying, or as it was put um, in, in, the, in the consultation, um, the bill would, quote, set out an aspirational vision based on guiding or foundational values. The wording of this question and the accessibility of the consultation more broadly is something I'll come on to in a minute, but I'd like to hone in on this suggestion first. So when it was raised, we, we, we held a workshop um, with a bunch of our service users, um, just kind of putting it out to trans folks um, who were interested in the Bill of Rights or wanted to learn more about it and wanted to respond to the consultation and feed into our response and advocacy on it as well. Um, we, we asked this question to them and it was met with, with almost equal amounts of confusion and anger. Trans people and so many other communities across Northern Ireland are having their rights abused right now, today and every day. From the issues I've already mentioned around legal recognition and access to healthcare to the indefinite detention of migrants and refugees in Lord Detention Centre and the cruel treatment of disabled people on PIP that you've already heard. An aspirational vision of rights is nothing without actionable rights to back them up. Have your aspirational vision as the preamble to a Bill of Rights, but a Bill of Rights with no actionable rights is meaningless. Human rights are not for the future, they're not something we should aim for, they're not something the government should maybe think about potentially uh, upholding somewhere down the line. Human rights are for here and for now. Human rights are for 23 years ago when this bill was agreed in the Good Friday Agreement. They're something we should already be focusing on, already be upholding, already be pushing for. And to pay mere lip service to rights in a bill purported to protect them does nothing for those currently suffering. Coming back to an earlier point, it's incredibly important that the public consultation and engagement on this issue is done in line with best practice and in a way that is meaningfully accessible to as wide a range of people as possible. It's also an opportunity to educate people on where this come from and the, on the history of the bill. Uh, reading the public consultation, you would never guess that the Bill of Rights was agreed in the Good Friday Agreement. Context is incredibly important, especially whenever, you know, we have a, a generation of post Good Friday Agreement young people kind of growing up and getting interested in politics and getting interested in affecting uh, their society, we need to make sure that they're educated on where all this stuff came from. Accessibility is just as important as well. The wording of these questions combined with the lack of framing context led to a situation where without the wonderful workshops and public awareness campaign run by the Human Rights Consortium, I don't think that this would have reached as many people. Working proactively within the community and voluntary sector, and in particular, uh, with young people and those with learning disabilities to make sure that consultations and engagement are accessible to as many people as possible is absolutely essential for good governance and good legislation. Within the, the workshop that we held um, on the Bill of Rights, 
while a significant proportion of time was spent unpacking those questions, there was also a good amount spent on some particular issues that trans people face in their day-to-day -day lives. Something that came out very strongly from the workshop is the fact that disabled or neurodiverse trans people feel like their disabilities are being used within statutory services to deny them autonomy, to deny them their identity, and to deny them access to gender affirming healthcare. The treatment of disabled people generally in Northern Ireland and across the UK is an absolute disgrace, as you've already heard. But when that intersects with other demographics, such as trans identity, for instance, people can run into significant barriers to accessing support and care. Even, even kind of additional barriers on top of the ones that they already face. Something else that became quite clear from this workshop is that many of our service users have absolutely no faith that this process will result in anything. And frankly, can you blame them? After 23 years, multiple public consultations and a sickening amount of politicking, it seems as though we're right back where we started. And that's incredibly unfortunate, but I think symptomatic of how this government has run over the past 23 years. The rights of minority communities have consistently been violated. This government and these processes are in and out of a state of political deadlock as well. So, you know, show our communities that you actually work for them and make sure that, you know, this process actually goes somewhere so we can see that that human rights are central um, to, to Northern Ireland, are central to um, our future in this region. On a personal level, I'm a 20 year old trans woman from the border regions who up until a month or two before I left school was absolutely desperate to leave Northern Ireland. I've sat and watched as so many of my friends, in particular queer young people, have gone on a plane or a ferry and went off to Britain or further afield to get out of this place. And maybe that was a conscious choice, but the reality is that we are being pushed out. We are being pushed out of homophobic and transphobic schools. We are being pushed out of healthcare. We are being pushed out of employment through discrimination and abuse. We are being pushed out of the public sphere through harassment and abuse levelled at us in the media and even by some politicians. Is it any wonder why so many of our young people choose to leave. Their rights aren't being upheld, so they'd rather go somewhere else. I stayed because I, I wanted to work to make Northern Ireland a better place for trans communities. Others stay because they're broke, or they can't get out, or because they've built up a network here, or because they want to be close to family, or because they too see an opportunity to make this place better. The Bill of Rights is not a cure-all, but it could signal a sea change in how Northern Ireland functions and is, and is governed. It could convince some of our young people that this is truly a new approach for a new decade. I would urge you all to not repeat the mistakes of the past and to do everything in your power to ensure a Bill of Rights that offers substantial and meaningful protections for all communities in Northern Ireland. Thank you very much for, for having me and for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Alexa. That was um, a useful briefing and I suppose taken in in the round along with the, the consultation response that you had provided uh, to us prior to today's meeting. It, it has covered quite a, a range of, of topics and a, a lot of the, the issues that you feel and I suppose it, you can you can very clearly feel your frustration um, and as, as somebody that obviously is, is a big representative for for the, the community that you're you're working within and, and the, the people that you're you're advocating for. Um, it, that that was that was really useful and and appreciate that. Thank you. Just in the in the first instance, there's a couple of things I want to to touch on or or see if you will expand upon. So you referred there some of the words that you used in terms of rights as a framework, rights you know a rights based approach, um, using rights. I, I I've asked loads of the people that we've had here how they would view a bill of rights as an accountability measure. So you know. We, we've had some people, and I know you've expressed sort of discontent at the thought that socioeconomic rights are almost pitted against other rights or this this whole thing. And I'd referred when I was asking Tony questions around the sort of rights versus resource argument that I sort of don't put any weight on and think is a is a sort of a cop out to be honest with you and, 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 and don't accept. And I know that we've had comments from, from people who who will say that by putting these rights in a bill of rights, we're building people's hopes up and these things might be in a bill of rights, but they're never going to be achieved. And I would sort of take the attitude, well that's not good enough. You know, there's resource there to deliver the things that people want to, to deliver and ministers should prioritize rights for everyone because rights are universal. So you know increasing the rights of a, a, a trans individual or a non-binary person or 
uh, somebody from a, an ethnic minority or whatever isn't going to lessen the rights that anybody else has. Um, so I just wonder if, you, if you'd if you delve into that a wee bit more. Of course. And I mean, I think that the, the rights versus resource argument is, is an incredibly important one. Um, and it's one that I think about a lot because uh, whenever we're looking in particular at trans healthcare, um, that's one of the areas where, you know, every time someone's talking about it, oh, it's, you know, the gender identity clinics need more money or the gender identity clinics need more staff. And that's, you know, sure, that, that might be part of the problem, but it's the entire structure. It's how trans people are treated. It's how trans identity is viewed as a disorder, as, as a mental disorder. It's framed within that kind of mental health framework. And if you take it out of that and put it into a human rights framework, if you put it into a framework of, for instance, sexual health uh, care provision, um, or if you bring it down to the GP level and make it a kind of primary care thing, it's actually going to be cheaper. Like uh, a lot of the things that we're advocating for in terms of making trans healthcare more accessible and, and reducing the invasive and interrogatory process that people are forced to go through. It's, it's cheaper than the way that they're currently doing it because the way that they're currently doing it inserts these kind of artificial waiting times because trans people are just not treated as though we have the, the rights and the competence to make decisions for ourselves and for our bodies. And so, you know, I do think that, you know, you're right, Emma, that this kind of resource versus rights argument is a bit of a misnomer. Um, and I, I don't like the fact that, you know, uh, the, 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 that economic and uh, kind of cultural, economic, social and cultural rights are pitted against civil and political rights. Because as I said, and I think we made this point in, um, in the consultation response as well, they are so intertwined. They are, you can't have one without the other. Um, and I think that, you know, <sighs> It's important that we don't view this as a cure-all because we aren't going to have a bill of rights and we're going to click our fingers and everything's going to be fixed. Um, that's that's impossible. There's there's a there's a million and one things that need to be fixed. But like if we look, for instance, at how the Northern Ireland Executive dealt with lockdown in late last year um, and how you know votes on on you know the 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 coronavirus lockdown were vetoed or or blocked um, by a a particular um, member or, or party in the executive and how the, the right to life and the right to health could just be blocked and kind of ignored like that. Again, you know, having having a Bill of Rights would put a framework in place to prevent things like that happening, to prevent um, these kind of very blatant abuses of human rights uh, for, for, from kind of taking hold and, and uh, going throughout our, our government. And I think just coming back on on a point on um, that was made with with Tony on on the kind of um, EQIAs, the equality impact assessments, and Section seventy five um, equality uh, screenings. Uh, just I mean, any time we see any of those, uh, it, it's the vast majority of times it's absolute nonsense. They they just haven't you know it hasn't been done right. It hasn't you know they haven't looked properly at the actual impact that a policy is going to have on minority communities. Um, or, you know, they haven't considered minority communities at all in the policy because, oh, well, it's it's just a general policy. It's going to benefit everyone. Um, and, and I do think that this kind of, this laissez-faire attitude to rights and to protecting my marginalized communities in the, the kind of government uh, governance of this region, it, it does need to change. And I think that a Bill of Rights would be a good start. Thanks, uh, Alexa. I mean, I can't disagree with anything that you've said. I suppose I just want to, and I know you've referred there to the problems at, at Brackenburn, and that's one of the things that I've been bringing up as well. You know, I feel that sometimes that, not to rehash, but that resource argument is used when it's actually a political decision. So you've made reference to, you know, women's health care at the minute and, and how the legislation hasn't been properly enacted in the North. The, the same with the, the gender identity services. And I think... Something that you touched upon there in terms of the percentage of young people that will experience, you know, transphobic or or um, homophobic bullying even in schools and from from teachers and from people that are supposed to be caregivers. And I always think when you when you decriminalize something or you criminalize something or you change legislation, that in that instance makes a thing illegal or legal or you know sets at that stage a law around a particular. Thing, but it takes some amount of years and usually a number of generations before you will see that particularly that particular mindset 
you know, embedded in within society. And the example there that you that I would always look to is like if you look at the, the deep south in America and the end of Jim Crow and segregation, we're still having racist incidents in current times in America because those attitudes haven't all been properly eradicated. And I think it's the same thing now when you're talking there about, you know, the fact that the law and we don't have a rights based approach. We don't have, you know, it it's set down as a standard that people who identify as trans are equal and entitled to the health care that they need or want or you know and are treated as if they've got a mental health problem as opposed to being being treated the way they want they want to be to be treated it, it facilitates that bullying and that discrimination at a local level or or tells people that it's that it's normal and that's fine to, to hold those views and to to voice them when when they want to so uh, i don't know if you've got got comments around that, that that's me i just want to thank you again Absolutely. No, I mean, uh, so just to kind of on, on the school experience, and I think that this is this is another area where a Bill of Rights will be incredibly useful because, you know, trans people have, um, so we're protected under our sex discrimination regulations. Um, so, you know, the sex discrimination, gender reassignment regulations, Northern Ireland order, um, that doesn't apply in schools. So you've got you've got a bit of equality legislation um, that protects trans people's rights to access goods, for ser services and facilities um, in, in most other areas of, of life, but it doesn't apply in schools. And this is what I mean whenever I'm talking about a patchwork equality uh, legislative framework. It is literally patchwork. There are people falling through the gaps um, and, and entire swathes of, of, of communities uh, that, that don't have rights. And, and especially when you're looking in places like education. And I think that it's quite stark um, when we think about mental health rates in the community um, because you know we, 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 we deliver a lot of training to a lot of um, service providers and healthcare workers and stuff like that um, and I mean there's some of the stats that, that we give is, is are quite quite stark and quite quite upsetting um, in some cases uh, I mean you know uh, across the island of Ireland trans people of all ages um, around 42% will attempt suicide at some point in their lives. And if you're looking specifically at under 25, that rises to 48%. So we have a very specific issue with trans young people um, in school being abused, being discriminated against, being bullied um, outside of school as well, um, you know, having negative um, experiences with their family or being stuck in a, a kind of a hostile living environment. Um, this has a real impact on people's mental health. It's not the trans identity co that causes the, the, the mental health issues. It's the, the fact that our society simply is not built uh, to support those communities at all. Thank you. That, that, that point is, is, is well made and, and heard. Uh, Mike, I'm going to let you in now. Okay, Chair, sure. thank you. Hi, Alexa. Um, those... You know, suicide and, and mental health, poor mental health rates in the, the trans community are utterly shocking. And so are the kilter uh, with, with the rest of society. And the rest of society has shocking rates of suicide and poor mental health. So I just, just want to acknowledge it. Um, and actually, you, you said early on, a Bill of Rights you saw as a starting point. So it's the same question I asked Tony. Do you think it not only is a Bill of Rights important in itself, but it's important as a sort of engine to drive a cultural change at the Assembly and in the Executive into how we do business, how we bring forward legislation, and indeed, as you say, even how we conduct, how we conduct the quality impact assessments? Absolutely. And I mean, I think that if we look at the history of the government governance of, of Northern Ireland over the past, you know, kind of, 23 years, uh, it is, uh, as uh, this isn't an original point, it is very orange and green. It is very, you know, kind of divided along that axis rather than being, you know, maybe divided along the axis of, of you know, human rights or uh, protecting communities or, or providing services or whatever the case may be. I do think that, you know, I say that it's a starting point because, I mean, I can think of you know, 20 different other pieces of legislation that I would personally pass as if, if I ran the country, you know, um, not just a Bill of Rights, um, because, you know, it 
it does provide that framework. It does provide that 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 lens through which to view legislation, that lens through which to view policy change in terms of human rights, in terms of the impact it's going to have on the rights of individual communities and on the rights um, of, of, of people in Northern Ireland as a whole. And I think that, you know, while we will still have a very, very long way to go, uh, even if we do pass this, um, I think that one, yes, it'll have that cultural change. It'll send a signal to people in Northern Ireland that, okay, you know, this this is an actual change. This is an actual, you know, a meaningful difference to how we are going to do governance in Northern Ireland. Um, and I, I think and I, I hope that if this does pass and if, you know, the kind of public awareness and public education around it is is good enough that you know we we might even see just a change in in how people engage with politics how people engage um with with legislative change and and how willing people are to get involved in that side of things because i know so many young um lgbt people who would love to get involved in politics but are just so intimidated by the orange and green nature of it all by the the kind of the back and forth hostility of it all and the fact that just the legislation that is currently being passed and, and um, policies that are currently being pursued are just not not in line with human rights in a lot of different cases. Okay, I think, I think you've cleared up the, the, my concern about aspirational content. Um, you're not against it per se, but you're saying that belongs in the preamble and it has to be accompanied by, what, what's the current phrase, granular, granularity. Absolutely. In the, in the body of the text, yeah? Oh, 100%. I do think that, you know, there is a place, absolutely, for, for kind of a vision of where we're going, a, an aspirational vision. Um, I do think that it's, it's, it's nothing without those concrete rights to back them up. Um, and I, I think that the general public and especially minority communities, um, you know, if we have that preamble without the, the concrete rights, um, I think it, it, it would be a bit of a slap in the face, to be honest. Yeah, well, I, I would agree. But I think preamble... It sets out a vision and also a rationale explains why we're doing what you're about to read in the, in the main body. Make makes sense. Finally, Alexa, any, any Bill of Rights internationally that you could point to that, that you think is a sort of template for us in, in terms of rights for transgender or LGBTQ plus community? So um, I, I included a little bit in our consultation just with regards to um, the, the different UN treaties and conventions and committees um, that have basically passed uh, motions and, and, and stuff like that on, um, on, on kind of recognizing uh, SOGI-esque is, is, is how it's referred to in international human rights. Um, it's sexual orientation, gender identity, expression and sex characteristics. Um, so kind of expressing that SOGI-esque is included in their individual conventions. So that is, you know, um, I, th I think it was um, CRPD uh, passed that. It was CEDAW as well um, and, and a few others. I mean, we would recommend that the essential, essentially the wholesale importing um, of, of those conventions um, and, you know, the International Covenant on, um, on Economic and Social and Cultural Rights and, and um, the civil and political rights as well. Um, I don't necessarily, we don't have like a, a specific template in mind. And I mean, this is one of the, the areas that I think that um, we actually need to be pushing, pushing the ball on. Um, I think that in, in this area, in the area of gender recognition and in the area of, of trans healthcare, Northern Ireland actually has an opportunity to not just kind of follow uh, the, the, the the Ireland or, or the rest of the UK or other parts of the world, I think we have an opportunity to lead um, other parts of the world in this area and, you know, co-developing this and co-designing this with the minority communities that are going to be meaningfully affected um, will create legislation that is fit for purpose and, and inclusive of all communities. Excellent. Thank you. So I know you're big into the Youth Forum. They're, they're launching a mental health kit in half an hour. Looking forward to it. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I was I was a member for two years um, in my younger years. <laughs> but um, yes, no, they're, they're doing excellent work. Yeah, no. Alexa, thanks very much. Take care. Thanks, Chair. OK, Mike, I've got Paula and then Carol and the kitten. So, Paula, if you want to. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Alexa. That was really, really great today. I have to say, I've never heard the um, 
the issue of trying to separate civil and political from social economic rights put so well in terms of you just can't see like you know it's like um they're so in- intertwined and I thought that was excellent the way you put that forward um yesterday I was on the rainbow project um website looking up something and as you know if you go on a website and you spot other things you look in and one of the pages I came across was a trans swim um event and when you read the testimonies for the people who go to it they were so powerful you know they were like I haven't put on the swimsuit since 1998 and you know and, and you just you, you just don't realize how marginalized trans people can be and I was just wondering and you know and sort of reflected in many ways this is probably women 40 years ago who were walking down the street without a wedding ring on pregnant women or you know gay men walking down the street holding hands and stuff and I wonder how much you think that specific mention of the transgender community within a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland would really move us on as a society in terms of acceptance and even just inner peace for people within your within the transgender community. Oh, one hundred percent. And I mean, you know, that the the trans swimming event that's run by the Rainbow Project is honestly one of the, the best initiatives that has come out of the LGBT community in a long time. I really do think it's excellent. And I mean, you know, I, I miss the sea myself. I miss I miss swimming. Um and and I know so many people who just haven't been swimming since they come out as trans, um, because because of that feeling of, of the, you know, the lack of safety or or um or you know the the lack of comfort in in those spaces um sorry um uh, <clears throat> i do think that um across the uk and and a- across um these islands generally speaking the way our legislation talks about trans communities the language that is used within our legislation and you know the focus on you know gender reassignment and um, gender identity disorder and all of these transgenderism all of these different like really outdated um and, and, and specific terms um i do think does a lot of harm um to to trans communities and does a lot of harm to people just trying to understand what their rights are um under these particular bills um and i do think that you know having a specific inclusion of trans people not you know like in section 75 where trans people are included under men and women generally um having them having us specifically named um again it's not a cure-all it's not gonna fix the the community's um dis- distrust or often disinterest in the the kind of uh, political climate in northern ireland um but it will go some way to making us feel like, oh, actually, you know, we do have rights in Northern Ireland. You know, we do have something that we can fall back on. We do have a means by which to challenge abuses of rights. Um, and I think that that is a really important symbolic and material uh, kind of uh, gain. Um, I, I really do. Yeah, no, I think I think it would be a boon uh, to the community. Thank you. And just the, the second question was in relation to access to health care. Alexi, you mentioned there, you used the word a phase of pr- processes. And I just wonder if you could elaborate on that and in the context of how a Bill of Rights could influence it and, you know, the, the sort of co- connectivity between the two um, premises. Absolutely. So, um, I mean, the, uh, the Tony before me talked a lot about human dignity and respect. Um, and integrity um, going through these kind of statutory processes in terms of applying for PIP or, or anything like that. Um, and we, and I mean, like, I think this goes, this goes more widely than healthcare. Trans rights and um, disability rights are, have such a, a kind of con- interconnected and intertwined history. And, you know, we, we often talk about them in the same frameworks um, because in the gender identity services in Northern Ireland and, and across the UK, you know, um, we see trans young people of, um, under the age of 16 being asked about their sex life, about their sexuality, about their masturbatory habits, about, you know, all of these horrible and invasive um questions that in many cases just have absolutely nothing to do with someone's trans identity um and that continues into um adult uh, services as well you know there's um so uh, we we often hear of of people having a gender identity clinic suit or a gender identity clinic dress that they wear to basically you know tick the box for the clinician to show that they're living in role um, as a trans person. And, you know, I think that the the kind of right to dignity um, and integrity and respect um, that, that could 
potentially be included in a Bill of Rights um, would again, you know, give us a tool to advocate and say, okay, actually this isn't this isn't on, this isn't right. Um, and it's not just immoral, but it, it's potentially in breach of human rights um, if we're able to make that case. Uh, because, you know, we can make that case now and they can say, oh, well, too bad. Um, there's, there's no, you know, there's, there's no legal obligation um, placed on, 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 you know, kind of um, gender services or, or um, any other statutory services in terms of uh, protecting and upholding trans people's human rights. I think if, if we do put that uh, obligation uh, on statutory services and on the executive, I think that we will see a bit of a change in terms of how trans identities are viewed, how, how trans lives are viewed, um, and how trans people are consulted on our own healthcare, on our own um, issues, you know, it's we, we see a lot in and it's it's a similar issue to what Tony was mentioning previously in terms of other people advocating for us, cis people, non trans people advocating on our behalf and saying what they think trans communities need. Um, we know what we need. We are experts in our own care. We are experts in our own human rights um, and making sure that that, you know, that kind of co-design and co-development processes are enshrined um, in, you know, how the government works is absolutely essential. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks, Paula. We've got Carl and then Mark. Hi, Alexa. Um, very interesting presentation, um, very thought provoking, but also very welcomed um, because white people are converted now to the idea of rights around economic and social um, justice. I welcome that, but that wasn't the case. And just to say that um, I mean, our assembly was down for three years over the lack of human rights. Uh, and I know, I know you're, you know that because you're, you were very active in the campaign um, around having rights addressed. But the issue is that unless, and you know, unless there is a clear written into law that it's not equality for some, it's equality for all, and that equality legislation needs to be in the base of rights or in the Bill of Rights, then we're going to be repeating problems of the past. Um, so, um, I mean, I, I have no questions. I think you're, you're, I just want to give you that by way of comment. I think your presentation, along with Tony's, not only was powerful, but also um, it just, it just sang. So, Thank you, Alexa. Thank you very much, and I, I appreciate the comments. I'll just come in there then, Alexa. <laughs> here. I hope you're well. Uh, thank you again for, for, for that presentation. Uh, members have been I'm very impressed by it, and I, I'm no different in that regard. Uh, Paula had sort of touched on, on this issue, but it's would you advocate for a Bill of Rights to have rights specific to trans people, or is it your position that trans people would benefit from the way the rights discussed as a minority group? Um, I think that, uh, well, I, I think both, um, just uh, that trans people will absolutely benefit from just having a Bill of Rights there. Um, I do think that, you know, certain minority and marginalised communities do need to be named um, in a Bill of Rights and, and just making sure that, you know, this applies to all, that there is no exception um, in terms of who this Bill of Rights applies to. They're all the same rights. We all, you know, kind of uh -huh. making, making it clear that we all have the same rights. It's just that, you know, it, it is absolutely unequivocally applying to all of these different groups. Because um, I, th I think that, you know, there's there's been an attempt in, in Britain um, in the past number of years to exclude trans people from equality legislation and and to kind of roll back on, on the rights um, kind of achieved by trans uh, rights activists in the past. So I think that, you know, naming it specifically, naming our communities yeah. um, in that it would be a good thing. And just now, now that you mentioned the legislation in Britain. You had said, I think, that equality legislation related to trans pupils in schools in Britain doesn't apply here. What is that specific legislation? And 
Have there been any cases here in the north of a trans pupil maybe challenging the school's treatment through the judicial review grounds mentioned? So as far as I'm aware, there's no, there's been no judicial reviews um, on this particular issue. Um, I think, I think what I, what I was referring to there was so um, in Northern Ireland, uh, trans people's rights to access um, goods, facilities, and services um, is contained in the sex discrimination regulations. Um, so uh, that that's basically, you know, we don't have an equality act. We we ha- we have that and a few other bits of patchwork equality legislation. Um, and many of those uh, bits of uh, legislation don't apply in schools. Basically, um, section seventy five uh, that doesn't really uh, kind of come into um, uh, action in schools. Um, and so what that what that means is that there's essentially a, a gap in rights. Uh, for trans people and for LGBT communities more broadly, there's there's no legal obligation on schools to provide support or or or, or, or equality of access for those peoples. Um, and so, hopefully, again, you know, I don't envisage a bill of rights being the cure all for this stuff. I do, however, think that it will push us towards a place where where rights are for everyone and everywhere. Um, there aren't exceptions. And uh, you mentioned in your submission underemployment among minority communities here, including, of course, the, the trans community. Of course, we, we do have here legislation to protect against employment discrimination, whether or not that's enforced uh, robustly enough is a, a different question. But uh, how might a bill of dress, I don't know if it's if it's fair to address this question to you, Alex, like it's certainly something I think we as a committee will need to consider, though. But how might a bill of rights address underemployment and you know i just wonder how how someone might bring a case on that in the future so um well from from my perspective i mean some of the most important um rights that should be contained in a bill of rights are workers rights uh the rights to safety and work the rights to form a trade union the rights to um you know kind of uh, organize and ensure that your workplace is a uh, a, a, an inclusive place, a, a place where you feel safe and you feel supported um, and you feel able, able to, for instance, um, challenge uh, discrimination against you or challenge, um, you know, when members of the public um, are, are discriminatory or abusive, um, because a lot of the times it is actually a, a public thing. It's a, it's a kind of, it's an issue of interactions um, with the public and you know the discrimination that may come from that and, and trans people not feeling not feeling like they'd be able to challenge that or else they'll be fired um mm-hmm. and and you know the lack of unions and the the lack of kind of organized workplaces um is a massive concern in a lot of places uh, where you know trans people can you know there there is technically employment discrimin- discrimination legislations yeah. but for instance if a trans person is getting misgendered or, 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 or um, kind of experiencing transphobia from members of the public every single day um, and having poor mental health and, and maybe um, not being able to come in as a result of that, um, you know, that's obviously going to lead to um, disciplinary action or them being fired or, or whatever the case may be. Um, so it isn't necessarily a case, every case isn't necessarily something that could be challenged yeah. in terms of discrimination. However, um, it's 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 about kind of again as as has been said multiple times, creating that culture, um, making sure that those rights are are kind of enshrined um, and understood and are very clear, um, so that people know when and where they can challenge uh, where they feel like their rights have been abused. No. Again, you know, not a cure all, but building towards um, a Northern Ireland that that is better for 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 everyone. Yeah, and I think that's. That's what we all want. So thanks a million for that, Alexa. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay. I don't think... Can you hear me? Oh, sorry. My my um, mute button, isn't, it's not flashing up. Um, okay. I don't think we've got anybody else indicating. So... I think at this stage, Alexa, I can just thank you. You've you've been put through your paces there and answered quite a few questions. So uh, just thanks again for joining us this afternoon and uh, for your contribution to the to the meeting and, and to your work. And you've you've given us um, a very meaningful and and good presentation. So just thanks again. Enjoy the rest of your day, and uh, we'll we'll let you go. Thank, thank, thank you, Alexa. Um, thank you. See you later. Bye, folks. Okay, thank you. Um. Mm-hmm.
Okay, members, um, we can now just tear on with the rest of our meetings. So um, the fourth item on our agenda is chairperson's business, which we don't have any this week. Um, number five, we've got our draft minutes. If members are content with the minutes of the 11th of February as they're currently drafted. Great. Yeah, don't see any dissent. Uh, then matters arising. We've got no matters arising this week. Can I direct members then to item number seven, correspondence? We've just got um, the correspondence memo uh, at page 37. You'll find a letter from Conan and Gilliga who have asked us if they can uh, present evidence in session to the committee. So if everyone's ag agreed with that, we can invite Conry in. Great, yeah. Agreed. Happy days. And so then we have number eight, our forward work program. Um, we'll see we've, we don't have that many meetings left, but we've got quite a few presentations um, coming up. So we're, we're, we're still continuing with the work. If everyone's happy with that. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Happy days. So then any other business at number nine, if anyone has anything that they would like to raise? No. Shaking heads. Brilliant. That lets us go on to the date, time, and place of the next meeting. So we've Thursday, the 25th of February at 2 p.m., same time, same place for using your respective office. And uh, I'll leave it there. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Emma. Take care, everybody. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly 